Well, welcome. Did everybody get the purple, purple sheet? Everybody got one? For those of you who may be interested, and I direct that to the row there, I have these notes every week, and I have extras of past weeks if you want to latch onto those. It'd be pretty. And then for those of you who may or may not know, what we do here on Sunday morning is uh, listen to or watched in churches in North Carolina and Africa on Wednesday. And pastors teaching on Wednesday is then watched by churches in North Carolina and Africa on Sunday, the following Sunday. So we got that outreach. So when you think of us, just just uh, pray for that as we reach out. And then we've gotten replies from people in different areas too that, that contact us and, and want stuff and everything like that. That was the the uh, kind of the push to to put the the notes on because we had people say, well, yeah, it's uh, it's good to have the video, but we'd like the notes too. The the teacher keeps referring to the notes, so we want the notes, so they're on there. Okay, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love to us. Thank you for your word that it is alive and powerful. And so as we look at today, may we, may we look at it with, with reverence. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're talking about Moses. And we've come to the part where the Israelites will receive some cruel treatment from the Egyptians. And this is a prelude to the... Uh, the God dealing out the plagues on, on the nation of Egypt uh, to judge them for, for what they have done over the last 400, what they've done for better than 400 years leading up to this particular time. They've been in bondage, and so God is going to deliver them with a great hand. Remember, we talked last week where where or a couple of weeks ago where God says, I'm going to come down. So he says, uh, I, in chapter 3, verse 8, so he says, I have come down. I've seen what's going on there and, and the problem that the Israelites have. So uh, I'm going to come down. And, and I, I, made, I made reference to the fact that I felt that was very significant because in the terminology there coming down where God comes down and deals with earthly stuff on the far, on the part of the the nation of Egypt. Next week, you don't want to miss this. Next week we're going to be talking about the plagues of Egypt. We probably won't cover all ten of them next week, but I'd like you to read ahead and uh, and look at the plagues of Egypt and. And what takes place in the plagues is God, in response to what, and we'll cover this a little bit today, in response to what Pharaoh says about the fact that he does not know Yahweh. And know anything about God, has a disdain for the God of the Israelites, and so what is going to take place with the plagues is God is going to attack the gods of Egypt. Because each one of those items that are involved in those plagues was in some way worshipped by the Egyptians. So we're going, to, we're going to talk about that starting next week. So let's look at the introduction. Take your little purple sheet. Here we have, we finished our lesson last week where God tells Moses to assemble the elders of Israel, tell them what God had called him to do, that is, God was going to be, use Moses to be the deliverer. And God said the elders would listen to him and respond favorably to him. And then God also told Moses to take the elders with him, go to Pharaoh and tell them that the God of the Hebrews has met with us, so let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. And we'll 
talk about that and the reason for that a little bit later. <clears throat> then God also tells Moses that the king of Egypt would not let them go unless a mighty hand compels him to do so. And despite God's seemingly overwhelming evidence that he had called Moses to lead the Israelites out of bondage, Moses still gave uh, a couple more excuses. The people would not believe him. And then he wasn't eloquent enough. Elo eloquent enough. And God dealt with these excuses, especially the last one, the eloquence thing, where God gets very upset. Up to, up to that point, he'd been pretty tolerant with Moses. But then when Moses says, you know, send somebody else, God gets very upset. He says, I can't talk. And so God dealt with these ex excuses, and in doing so, in response to, especially to the last one, he brings Aaron, the brother of Moses, alongside Moses, has Moses' mouthpiece. And so today in our lesson, we find Moses and Aaron in the presence of Pharaoh as we begin chapter 5. So it says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the desert. Now, um, so Moses and Aaron simply go to Pharaoh and just tell Pharaoh what God has told them to do. Now, notice, Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. This is not just a flippant remark by Pharaoh. Pharaoh was being honest and genuine here. He did not know. Uh, the pharaohs of Egypt, I put here in the note, believed themselves to be descended from their pagan god, Ra, or Re. And Ra was a masculine deity in the temple of the gods of Egypt, identified with the sun god. Just a little, you know, it's not all that important. You, you don't, it's not going to wreck your theology if you don't know about that. So, but I just thought I'd throw that in. I came across and I thought, hmm, I'll just throw that in because uh, I, I needed the space. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Therefore, Pharaoh thought it was beneath his dignity to humble himself before the God of the Israelite slaves. His sad inquiry, now listen to this, why should I obey his voice, would soon be resoundingly answered as the Lord sent devastating plagues upon Egypt. And yet even then, Pharaoh would refuse to humble himself before the Almighty God. He, he, he sends the Israelites out of Egypt, but he doesn't humble himself before the Lord. And so over to the second page, verse 3. Then they said, Moses and Aaron still talking to Pharaoh, the God, God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. Now, hold your thumb there, or finger or whatever, on Exodus 5, and turn over to uh, Exodus 8, verse 26, and let me just share with you the reason for the Israelites wanting to go on a three days journey in the desert to sac sacrifice to their God. And here's, here's what it says, Exodus 8, 26. Moses said, in response to Pharaoh saying, you know what, um, and here the situation was with each one of the plagues, and we'll see this uh, beginning next week, with each one of the plagues, as the plagues were dealt out, meted out, then Moses would repeat the request. Or the scriptures would say, but, but Pharaoh still refused to let the people go. So after we have the plague of flies, and we'll talk about those next week, but Moses said, uh, or Pharaoh says, 
Go sacrifice, verse 25 of chapter 8, go sacrifice to your God here in this land. But Moses said, that would not be right. The sacrifices we offer the Lord our God would be detestable to the Egyptians, and if we offer sacrifices that are detestable in their eyes, will they not stone us? We must take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God as he commands us. So I put here the fact that regarding the sacrifices being detestable or, or as one, I think the King James Version says, uh, abom an abomination to the Egyptians, either Egypt's strong dislike of shepherds and sheep, remember we mentioned uh, a few weeks ago that Shepherds were an abomination to the Israelites. It was the lowest of the low as far as an occupation. So e either Egypt's strong dislike of shepherds and sheep or Israel's sacrificial animals being sacred ones in the, in the religion of the Egyptians brought about Egypt's intense dislike of e Israel's sacrifices. One of the things that they did worship was the cow. Remember that, they worship the cow. And, uh, and so um, that, was, that involved a lot of the sacrifices centered around the, uh, the sacrifices of, of the Israelites. And so that could be a couple of reasons there why, why um, Moses. Remember, Moses was learned in all the habits and wisdoms of the Egyptians, so he knew this stuff. He knew who their God, gods were and everything like that. And so um, it's interesting. Um, and then we'll hit this a little bit more when we talk about the plagues being uh, uh, attacked, attacking the gods of Israel. We'll hearken back to the fact that Moses was, was well aware with that culture because he'd been part of it for many years. And he probably, during that time, thought, oh, gosh, I hate these gods. I hate these gods. I hate these gods. And so Moses is able to extract a little bit of revenge for having to participate at different times in the worship of those gods. And, uh, and he's going to see those, those things just fly by the wayside, fly by the wayside. What's, this, what's one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt have no what? Other gods before me. Now let me ask you this. Not a trick question because we've covered this in our morning meetings, either here or uh, in, the, in our uh, 11 o'clock meeting. How many gods are there? How many gods are there? One. one. Good job. No other gods before me. And the reason for that is because there are no other gods before me. Say amen. It's good. See, that's, that's good stuff. Good stuff. So that takes care of up to verse 4. Now, look at verse 4. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from your labor? Get back to your work. Pharaoh obstinately held to his view that the Hebrews were slackers, using the religious request of Moses as kind of a, a ruse to avoid their slave labors. Even in the midst of horrific plagues that would soon come upon the Egyptians that would demonstrate God's presence among his people, Pharaoh would still stubbornly refuse to believe the truth of the claims of the Israelites. See, they were not lying to Pharaoh. They were, they were simply communicating to Pharaoh what God had told them to do. God had told Moses and Aaron, go before Pharaoh. And if God says, go before Pharaoh, what do you do? You go before Pharaoh. And so they did that. But then look what happens. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and foremen in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw, 
from making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are trying, are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. So the note here is, is uh, to punish Moses and Aaron for their arrogance. Pharaoh then imposes severe measures on the Hebrew workers who needed straw to strengthen the sun-dried bricks they were making. Couldn't make a good brick without, without this straw, okay? And with no reduction uh, in their daily quota, the people would have to gather the straw during their off hours. And so up until the stringent measures were imposed, the scripture says that the Egyptians had provided the straw for them. So that was kind of the situation there. And so you can just picture these, these uh, Israelites trying to keep up with it. And they couldn't. They couldn't. Uh, and, and then in verse 9, Pharaoh makes an interesting statement. He says, make the word harder for the men so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Now, I want you to notice this. In this, just in this short sentence there in verse 9, Pharaoh presents an excellent picture of the world's system, which continually rejects the word of God. He was telling the Israelites that they were, in so many words he's saying, you are fools for believing in the Lord's word through Moses, your, your servant. He was saying, you are much better off, uh, you're much better off to accept the religious system that's already here and not chase after fables. You think this resonated with some of the Israelites? That reasoning? What do you think? You think it resonated? Put yourself in that position. You're, you've been in bondage. Basically, the, the, the religious system that, that you know is the religious system of the Egyptians. And then even though they were, were slaves, yet they had all of their needs met. They had three squares a day, if you please, and, and uh, probably pretty decent places to, to lodge in. And so uh, they, had, they, had all their, they had all their needs met. And so that's kind of the situation there. So, again, and we see this time and time again, Pharaoh would obstinately insist upon this false claim even in the midst of the most unquestionable proof of God's presence with Israel. And he's going to find it out. He's shortly going to find it out. Now, verses 10 through 14. The... The Israelites are given the new work orders from Pharaoh, and so needless to say, the Israelites couldn't fulfill the heavier workload. The Israelite foreman, who no doubt had grown accustomed to slightly better conditions and treatment than their fellow Hebrews, did not escape Pharaoh's wrath. So let's look at this here. Verse 10, Then the slave drivers and the foreman went out and said to the people, This is what Pharaoh says. I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. Now, keep in mind, they really had to scour and look around for straw because like I just mentioned, they, the Egyptians had provided it. They had brought it to them. It was there at the building site, if you please, you know, where they where they built the bricks. They, they brought it to the brickyard. And so uh, the, the Israelites, they probably thought, you know, this is great. So when, when Pharaoh says, you need to go get your own straw, it's like, where are we going to go? So they, he said, go get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. Very, very time consuming. Think of the practical aspect of that. Um, 
And again, this was really happening. This is not something that, that's just fairy tale stuff. This was actually happening. The, verse 13, uh, the slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. Kept reminding them, kept reminding them. The Israelite foreman appointed by Pharaoh's slave drivers were beaten and were asked, why didn't you meet your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? So I mentioned here that the, that the, the, the slave drivers of Israel, the ones that were in charge, were also uh, beaten. They weren't spared uh, Pharaoh's wrath. So, verses 15 to 19, third page there. The formal labor complaint at the highest level was rejected with an emphatic evaluation of laziness on the part of the Israelites and a demand that production not, not slack. Look at verse 15. Then the Israelite foreman went and appealed to Pharaoh. Here, here's the, the representatives for, for Israel. Why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy. That's what you are. You're lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now go get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. And the Israelite foreman realized they were in trouble when they were told you are not to, not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. Now, notice verses 20 and 21. Notice the note. The two-man leadership team of Moses and Aaron evidently knew of the lodging of this formal labor complaint, and so they waited outside the royal hall in order to meet Israel's representatives. And the meeting was not very cordial. With accusations raised both about the validity and the authority of the words and actions of Moses and Aaron toward Pharaoh. Pastor Dave and Pastor Tom, we don't think you're representatives of God at all. So this is where the leaders need to put themselves in the position of Moses and Aaron. And that's what was happening. They came out and they, they said, you know, we're beginning to wonder if there's any validity to what you're saying to Pharaoh. In other words, uh, and this is the way, remember Satan, our enemy, when he reveals himself, first of all in the garden, hath God said, hath God said. And so basically, this is, I call it, here we go, back to the garden. And here's the people, the representatives, the elders of Israel coming out and saying, you know what? Has God really said what you're telling Pharaoh God said? So they attacked the validity and the authority of the words and actions of Moses and Aaron toward Pharaoh. And the Hebrew leaders, that is the elders, were very quick to blame Moses and Aaron for their present suffering. We do that, don't we? As, as people. But here's the thing. Even though they had recently endorsed their authority from the Lord. Notice Exodus chapter 4, verse, beginning at verse 29. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. 
And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and they worshiped. And they said, okay, Moses and Aaron, go for it. But then when the going got rough or tough, the tough didn't get going. They melted and they, they, they just withered. They withered. And so And this behavior, the complaining, I just, I thought about this and then made, just read, read ahead and, and through the wandering, the, the wilderness wanderings of the, of the Israelites. And I put this sad behavior would be modeled time and again as the Israelites made their way toward Canaan. They murmured, murmured about not having anything to eat. And then when they got something to eat, they said, well, it's too much. And on and on and on and on. And this is the way we are. And we just need to stop it. We just need to stop it. See? And uh, pray for our leader. Pray for Pastor Dave. Pray for me as we lead. Our job, our job, we take from the book of Ephesians where we are instructed to equip people in the church to do the work of ministry. And, and, uh, I want to tell you this. Let's, I want to. I hope you allow me to to blow our own horn for a minute. We work our spiritual butts off to to get this stuff done, you know. And uh, you can come in in, in here any time of day uh, during the week, and you'll find the pastor back there or up here. You know, I've been here at different times during the week, and that's where he is. You know, he's he, he he's not you know in 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 the middle of Garville stacking BBs. Oh, yeah, gosh, you know. And so, um, but enough said about that. But you, you get the picture to equip. And so, so you need to come and say, okay, I want to be equipped. I want to do ministry. I want to do ministry. See? And uh, those of you who are involved in, the, uh, in the, the ministry on the square to the homeless folks, hang in there. Hang in there. I was sharing with, Pastor and I were sharing at lunch this, this Wednesday. You know, you know when those of you who are doing that ministry, you know when you're really, I mean, you're excited. I, I hear the excitement, see the excitement on a part of a lot of you. But you know when you're really going to get excited will be the very first time that you sit down with somebody, you share with them the plan of salvation, and you say, so based upon this, would you like to ask Jesus to come into your heart and be your Savior? And when they say yes, and then you pray with them as they receive Christ, that's going to be, I remember the first car I ever sold. I thought, man, I can do this. I remember the first person I ever led to the Lord. And the rush that I got, you see, the rush that I got. And uh, I've often said, when, when I cease to have a rush uh, with teaching the Word of God, I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to quit. But I enjoy it. I enjoy it. Okay, and trust that you enjoy taking it in and then putting it into practice. So those of you who are involved in ministry there at the square, Keep coming. Those of you who, who aren't yet, come and get involved. Even if you just kind of walk around and observe. I've been there two or three times, and the first time I was there, I just kind of observed. I just kind of observed. Hmm. Now, I want you to notice something. Moses was a good listener and a good leader. And so he listens to these elders. And they say, the Israelite foreman realized they were in trouble when they were told, you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. Verse 20, when they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting to meet them. And here's an interesting point. 
Moses and Aaron knew a little bit about what was probably taking place inside. And I think in their spirits a little bit, they wanted to run and hide. I've had bosses down through the years that they believed that there was safety in hiding. I remember South Fork had a principal and he was my boss. And I, uh, he says, I remember he called me in one time and I'm thinking, what have I done? Well, I hadn't done anything. He just wanted to pick my brain. And he says, some people are upset with me. Got teachers and everything upset with me here at the, here at the school. You have any idea why? He says, well, I don't know, but I says, uh, I want to mention one thing. And I says, promise you won't fire me. <laughs> he says, I promise. I says, I think, and I called him by name. I says, I think a lot of times you believe there is safety in hiding. Well, it's a good thing uh, you got me to promise you I wouldn't fire you. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> or we're, I mean, he didn't use those exact words, but I, I'm not going to repeat them here in church. But the thing is, Moses and Aaron could have taken off. They'd have gone, they could have gone and hidden behind a pil- pillar in one of the temples or something. But they didn't. So they were there. And out come these leaders, and they said, May the Lord look upon you and judge you. You have made us a stench. We stink to Pharaoh and his officials, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. They're about ready to do away with us. So what, what, what does Moses do? And here's a thing we need to, to learn from Moses, especially leaders. Moses returned to the Lord. He says, God, it's your problem. And here's what he says. O Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble upon this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. Was Moses making a true statement? Say yes. Nod your head. He was. Because this is, in reality, this is what was happening. And so uh, the observation was correct. And what Moses probably expected, he expected Pharaoh to cave in as soon as Pharaoh heard the use of the Lord's name, Yahweh. Because, yeah, you bet, just However, Moses seemed to forget that God had warned him that Pharaoh would harden his heart and refuse to let the people leave Egypt. Plus, like we mentioned before, Pharaoh had already declared that he did not even know who Yahweh was. Plus, Moses seemed to be having a difficult time realizing that God's plan was unfolding and that God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, was in full control of all these unfolding events. Okay. Let me go, Cindy. I think that's how the the Israelites were. They thought that Moses was going to save them. They would just leave, have no problem. I mean, God was working not only in their hearts as he was on Pharaoh and the people yeah. of Egypt. Yeah. I mean, God had to do his work. And sometimes we're like that. We want everything just to go just, it has to go just right. Hmm. But there are roadblocks and mm-hmm. there are, there's trials that we need to go through mm-hmm. in order to see the mighty hand of God. Mm-hmm. Right? We don't Amen. just get it just because we get Amen. it. So. And, and I think that's what he was dealing with. You bet. He was, and, he, and Moses was dealing with that. Moses was dealing with that. It's tough being a leader. It's tough being a pastor. You ever felt like running? I felt like running. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times you expect persecution 
and problems from without. In other words, out from out in the world. But you don't expect it inside the walls of the church. See? Hmm. Hmm. Sometimes we just want to give up. Mom came into the room one morning and she says to her son, get up. It's time to go to church. He says, I don't feel like going to church. She kept harping at him. Harping at him. Well, give me three reasons why I should go to church. She says, number one, it's Sunday. Number two, I got your clothes laid out. And what was number three? You're, You're the pastor. <laughs> and sometimes we just want to, I don't feel like it. What? What did you say, babe? Oh, yeah. I've had Sundays. I remember when I was at Shelter Cove and we were going through stuff. There were times where I'd say, but when Nancy said, babe, you need to get moving here, I said, why don't you call so-and-so, one of the trustees or one of the elders, and tell them to run the meeting this morning. And, and, and Nancy would say, honey, you are the pastor. You are the pastor. See, and that's it. And so God has brought Moses and the people to a spot where they are very desperate very desperate and we're going to finish up with verse 1 of chapter 6 and notice this then the Lord said to Moses could he have said what he's about to say before sure he could but again God was orchestrating everything and stuff was unfolding and in response to Moses God announces that he God had finally set the stage for dealing with Pharaoh. Listen. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Circle or underline the word I. What I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. And you see, this Pharaoh who had resolutely refused to let the enslaved Israelites leave Egypt would soon drive them out of the country. Let me finish up reading a couple verses. Exodus chapter 11, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and out on Egypt, and after that he will let you go from here and when he die, does, he will drive you out completely. He will drive you out completely. And then verse, uh, verses 31 to 33 of, um, oh gosh, of chapter 12. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, get up. Leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and, and also bless me. Hmm. The Egypts urged the people to live, hurry and leave the country. For otherwise they said, we're going to all die. Leave completely. Leave completely. And you see, when God... Have you ever been in a position where you've just struggled with something for a long time and then all of a sudden it's gone. God moves in, delivers you. You get complete deliverance. And you're on the other side of it and you look back and you say, God, that was awesome. That was awesome. Okay. Closing comment. I put here, I don't think we're much different than Moses. I don't think we're much different than Aaron. I don't think we're that much different than the Israelite slaves. Some of us are like Moses. 
We're called to serve, but we're full of excuses. Some of us are like Aaron. We get called alongside those who are called and, the, and those who are making the excuses. And then some of us are like the Israelite slaves. We are prone to complain when things don't go just the way we want them to. And if we really want to be Christ followers, we've got to believe that God has a plan. God has a plan. He will unfold it in a timely manner. And he's also, we need to understand that he's in control of the events surrounding his plan. His plan. Hmm. Any questions or comments?